from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martha Kennedy. I am a curator of popular graphic art in the Prints and Photographs Division. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2018 Swan Fellows Lecture today. This program is sponsored by the Swan Foundation for Caricature and Cartoon and the Prints and Photographs Division. The Swan Foundation is one of the few that provides direct support for scholarly graduate research in the field of caricature and cartoon through annually awarded fellowships. Since 1977, it has been an important part of the library's graphic arts program. The foundation underwrites important work relating to caricature and cartoon here at the library. And this includes preservation and processing of the library's holdings of comic art, development of these collections, related public programs, and many exhibitions in the Graphic Arts Gallery and other galleries in the library's Thomas Jefferson Building. And in fact, there are some up right now that you might find of interest if you haven't seen them. There um, is a new selection of original Herb Block drawings uh, from 1968 in the Herb Block Gallery, part of this complex, and also drawn to purpose, um, which consists of illustration and cartoon art by women creators. This event is being videotaped for future broadcast on the library's website and other media. So we encourage you to ask questions and offer comments after the talk. If you participate in the Q&A, please realize that you are consenting to the library to possibly using your filmed image and remarks. Today's speaker, Erica Pazian, is a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at the Graduate Center uh, at the City University of New York. Her research focuses on Mexican visual culture in the 19th century, and her dissertation examines the visual culture of the United States and Mexico from post-independence to 1876 in order to establish the role of imagery in the formation of national identity in each of these countries. She has presented her research at the Association of Historians of American Art, uh, their biennial symposium, and the College Art Association annual conference. She has received the support for her research through the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies, their 2016 Summer Research Travel Fellowship, and the Early Research Initiative Knickerbocker Award for Archival Research in American Studies. She has been teaching art history at the University of Minnesota in Morris and St. Olaf College. During this year, she will complete fellowships at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth and the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. It has been a pleasure for me to introduce Erica to some of the resources in the Prints and Photographs Division and some other divisions here in the library. Her lecture today is titled, Villains to be Vanquished, Envisioning the Enemy in the United States-Mexican War. Please join me in welcoming Erica Pazian. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Uh, I also want to thank the Swan Foundation for generously supporting this fellowship and the Prints and Photographs uh, Division staff who provided me with helpful suggestions, remain patient as I called item after item from their collection. Um, so I really felt I benefited greatly from uh, this six-week fellowship that I completed last year. So this presentation focuses on images of the other produced on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border in response to the U.S.-Mexican War of 1846-48. to 48. The 20-month conflict was a watershed event for both nations that transformed the North American continent. Many U.S. citizens worried the war was an imperialistic thrust towards the fulfillment of Manifest Destiny that threatened to expand slave-owning territories. Mexicans' sense of both their young nation's instability and the aggressive nature of their northern neighbor was heightened by the conflict. <laughs> 
with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2nd, 1848. Mexico lost approximately half of its national territory in the north, and the United States acquired the modern states of California, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, and parts of a couple others, as you see here. Both nations were plagued by internal conflicts after the war, and each was plunged into civil war within 15 years of its conclusion. During this time of turmoil, Mexican and U.S. artists inundated visual culture consumers with satirical illustrations, comic and military prints, and polemical broadsheets that reached, reacted to the events of 1846-48 and worked to build a sense of national identity among their viewers. Through comparative analysis of images produced on both sides of the border, this presentation will first address the national identity inherited from each country's European rulers in the years prior to independence before examining images that conveyed localized notions of nation in the decades following independence. After the outbreak of the war, artists in the United States and Mexico continued to create allegories of power and homeland, but also used representations of battle's actualities. This double speak allowed artists to celebrate that which made their homeland unique while simultaneously vilifying the opposition. Through an examination of battle scene lithographs and satiric periodical illustrations that exemplify this concept, this presentation will demonstrate that the U.S.-Mexican War prompted artists to accentuate differences between homeland and enemy and encouraged each nation to define itself in contrast to its foe. These overarching of efforts to construct national identity inflected the visual cultures of both Mexico and the United States during the period of the North American continent's division into distinctive segments. National identity is a complicated term that is often defined dependent upon its context. Benedict Anderson defines nation as, quote, an imagined political community and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign, end quote. And Leonard Neboy describes nationalism as, quote, a sense of difference with regard to other communities, end quote. In the decades prior to the U.S.-Mexican War, the notion of nation was largely complicated by both countries' statuses as colonies. This is made evident in an examination of the allegorical figure of America, which we'll look at in just a second. Difference, when it comes to the Americas, was defined for centuries by Europeans. There was no distinction between North and South America, much less the United States and Mexico, and the name America referred to the Western Hemisphere, alternatively called the New World by Europeans. After the discovery, I'm using air quotes, uh, of the Americas, European images depicted the personification of America as an indigenous woman, two examples of, you, of which you see here. The figure highlights both the exotic nation, uh, nature of this new destination and the economic abundance the land possesses. The profusion of feathers that make up the figure's headdresses and skirts, as you can see here and here, and then also an addition of a cloak here, also made of feathers, uh, marks the figures and by extension the land as exotic. Their accoutrements, the bow and arrow, uh, that you see on the right, she has the quiver slung over her back and the arrow right here, excuse me, left, and the parrot, parrot, with the figure on the right, uh, along with their bare torsos, emphasize the deep connection between the primitive people and the land. In addition, the potential wealth of the land is highlighted in both images. The figure on the left passively spills gold coins from the arrow, uh, and her hand, while the figure on the right sits on a throne made up of a plethora of exotic fruits and vegetables. Images such as these informed Europeans' view of the Americas as a singular exotic land inhabited by exotic flora, fauna, and peoples. Uh, as it was the European nations of Spain and England that colonized Mexico and the United States respectively, European symbolism accordingly made its way to the New World, and the depiction of America across the Atlantic and was continually used both in the United States and Mexico as a symbol for their own nation. In the United States, early images such as the one you see here were often copied from British models and continued the tradition of depicting America as an indigenous woman. <coughs> 
the America figure, which is located right here to the right of this obelisk, is once again bare-breasted, and the partial clothing she wears is made of fur. This link to the notion of America as an untamed wilderness is further emphasized by her feathered headdress, unkept hair, and the arrow on the ground in front of her. In addition, she wears a pearl armband, which you can just make out here, likely an allusion to the wealth of America. Despite the many references to previous depictions of America, this image, published in the United States at the end of the American Revolution, offers us a glimpse of the transformation this allegorical figure undertakes in the U.S. context in later years. And that glimpse is represented by all the Grecian figures you see on the right. After the War of 1812, the first war that the United States fought as an independent nation against a foreign enemy, the nation worked to shed representations of itself established by others and instead create symbols and images that reflected its ideals on its own terms. Accordingly, America received a makeover, as demonstrated here. Now she's seated right here. Uh, as with the previous image, America is once again surrounded by references to antiquity, but in this instance, America herself has adopted the look of a Roman goddess. Like Minerva, the goddess of wisdom who stands beside her, America wears a modest gown, gladiator sandals, and a cloak. She still dons a feathered headdress, and a cornucopia rests beside her foot, as seen with other examples, but even these vestiges of previous depictions of America have shifted in meaning. Now the feathered headdress mimics Minerva's and maintains her orderly rather than unruly hairstyle. The cornucopia rests beneath a shield that you see here that bears the arms of the United States and includes the motto Union and Independence, as if to convey that the country is no longer a place of potential wealth, but instead enjoys prosperity due to its people's commitment to commerce and agriculture, who are personified by these two figures right over here. This prosperity is not without great sacrifice and great leadership, as represented on the right by this triumphal arch celebrating the War of 1812 and this equestrian statue of George Washington. Thus, in the U.S. context, the personification of America sheds or reframes the characteristics adopted from European depictions and incorporates Greco-Roman themes to tie to Greece, the birthplace of democracy, in order to identify the nation as one built on democratic foundations and create a new vision of America. In Mexico, the figure of America was an integral part of the visual culture of the colonial era. In this image, we see that the figure of America, oops, sorry, here on the right, uh, includes many markers of the European vision of the American continent and its peoples. She wears a feathered headdress, and a quiver is slung over her shoulder. Though more modestly dressed than European models previously discussed, she wears a dress vaguely based on generic indigenous attire that clearly marks her as other. Her clothing and accoutrements are further contrasted by the figure of Spain on the left, whose appearance bears much more in common with the previously discussed Minerva, as Spain is depicted as a Roman warrior wearing an armored dress and helmet and brandishing a sword and shield. Although the figure of New Spain, as Mexico was called during the colonial era, is clearly marked as the other, she is at the same time embedded in the affairs of her colonizer. The colors of her clothing match those of the Spanish flag, and her hand, like Spain's, reaches out to take an oath on the book and cross religion holds to defend the cause of Fernando VII, the former king of Spain who was overthrown by Napoleon in 1808, a year before the, this print was published. Firmly entrenched in Spain's visual traditions and political affairs, this image reflects the continued European view of America as an exotic other with no unique identity of its own. Mexican independence in 1821 marked a shift in Mexicans' perceptions of national identity as Mexicans rejected the identity of their Spanish colonizers and attempted to forge a new independent character. Thereafter, images of Mexico, no longer New Spain, began to shift to highlight the proud pre-Columbian heritage that for centuries had been suppressed by the Spanish. The personification of Mexico in an 1848 lithograph demonstrates this transformation. In many ways, the figure parallels the depictions of America previously discussed. 
perched on a crocodile throne, which is hard to make out, but here his head is right here. Uh, she um, wears an elaborate feathered headdress and extravagant jewelry to represent her status, holds a bow in her left hand, and rests her right hand on a cornucopia of produce. However, slight changes localize her to the Mexican context. The nopal cactus on her left, seen here, uh, is a symbol of the nation, and her dress is specifically a weepheel, an embroidered dress um, that was associated with pre-Columbian culture. In addition, the battle scene uh, to her right, which you can just make out here, represents the struggle for independence from Spain. Rather than completely re-envision the figure of America, Mexico localizes the once broad stereotypes to emphasize the components of Mexican culture that predate Spanish colonization. So, freed from the yoke of their foreign rulers, independent Mexico and the United States both attempted to establish national cohesion through reinvented allegorical figure of America that constructed national paths apart from their European colonizers. While these images helped create a sense of difference with regard to the European continent, it was not until the U.S.-Mexican War that artists on both sides set to distinguish themselves from their previous ally. So, switching gears. Although the decades following each country's independence allowed each nation to separate itself from its foreign ruler, Mexico and the United States struggled to find a tenable balance between creating a distinct national identity and maintaining diplomatic ties. Their uncomfortable relationship became increasingly stressed after Texas seceded from Mexico in 1836, as Mexican media outlets claimed that the United States had fomented the unrest in Texas and that the United States promoted Mexico's ruin in order to enrich itself. After the annexation of Texas by the United States in 1845, a move seen as an act of aggression by Mexico, all diplomatic communication lines between the two were severed, and by January of the following year, it became increasingly clear that it was only a matter of time before war was declared. On May 11th, 1846, President James K. Polk went before the Senate and House of Representatives and delivered a speech calling for war. Congress approved the declaration of war two days later, and Mexican President Mariano Paredes y Arriaga released a manifesto declaring a defensive war on the same day. The relationship between the neighboring nations abruptly shifted from resentment to open warfare, and cultural producers in both nations dutifully rose to meet the challenge of bringing the public the most up-to-date and complete coverage a war had ever received. Many of the major battles and prominent heroes of the war received media coverage, if you will, through lithographs. The war coincided with an outburst in lithography, as improvements in the medium allowed producers of visual ephemera to distribute their images to larger audiences than ever before, and reach them with an expediency that fine artists could not match. To today's viewer, the prints you see here may not bear much resemblance to today's newspaper graphics. But during the war, the public viewed prints as news sources and relied on war imagery to accurately convey settings and outcomes in a timely manner. Images were often stylized to evoke sentiments of pride and patriotism and were not overly concerned with accuracy, but nevertheless maintained journalistic value. Nathaniel Currier, a man today associated with the senior scenic picture prints, thanks to the ubiquitous holiday jingle, was in his own time considered one of the most prolific and innovative lithographers in the United States, producing over 85 prints of the U.S.-Mexican War alone, including the one you see here. To a casual viewer, this lithograph includes many characteristics of a typical battle image. The opposing sides are clearly distinguished by contrasting colors of their uniforms, the victor of the battle dominates the picture plane, and the text captioned beneath the image identifies the date, location, and outcome of the conflict depicted. Upon closer inspection, we can identify several visual cues that work towards two goals, celebrate the victory of the U.S. forces and depict the Mexican forces as inferior enemies. In order to establish legitimacy, the artist roots the scene in reality. The text beneath the image explains that this is a depiction of Colonel William S. Harney, who led parts of the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Dragoons 
in a pursuit of the retreating Mexican forces during the Battle of Churubusco on August 20th, 1847. This event was an important part of a larger final drive towards Mexico City and received major media coverage. By the time the image was printed, the skepticism of engaging in a seemingly unprovoked war that many U.S. citizens initially felt was replaced by an acceptance to the idea that the war was necessary to fulfill manifest destiny. This was in large part thanks to images such as this, which makes clear the contrast between the Mexican and U.S. forces and conveys fundamental ideals of U.S. national identity. In particular, Colonel Harney embodies the national character through his attire, his demeanor, and his leadership. When we compare his uniform to the slightly blurry uh, diagram on the right, my apologies, we see that his uniform is an amalgamation of several different military issued uniforms uh, as he wears the uh, trousers of a dragoon major, the jacket of a dragoon general, and uh, his hat is loosely based on the uh, hat actually of a private in the infantry. Um, the tassel that we see in the courier image is sort of uh, um, a mystery as to where exactly this long flowing tassel comes from, uh, but uh, it certainly emphasizes the colonel's rapid movement and heightens the urgency of the pursuit. Harney's domination of the battle is further conveyed pictorially through the many diagonal lines incorporated in this image. The sword sheath we see here attached to Harney's belt parallels his left leg, conveying the colonel's dynamic movement. The sheath's diagonal is extended through the horse's back left leg and leads us to the ground where we see a variety of uh, refuse from the colonel's wake. Uh, we see the obvious markers of a defeated force, including a musket and a sword from a fallen Mexican soldier. But then we also see more symbolic symbols of Mexican identity, including the trampled agave and the tattered sombrero here. These seemingly haphazardly placed items impress on the viewer both the physical reality of the U.S. troops' victory over the Mexican forces and also the ideological defeat of the Mexican people and its lands. The idea of physical and ideological victory is further conveyed through the positioning of the sheath's counterpart, the sword itself. The sword's parallel position to the sheath further emphasizes this ideal of movement, but also brings our eye up to the upper half of the image where we see the, sh the sword um, paired with the American flag. Um, on the left side of the image, we see a faint palm tree appearing out of the battle smoke. And finally, the last symbol to rise above the conflict is the cross held high by a fleeing Mexican soldier. The contrast between these symbols and the countries they are associated with is made clear. The sword and the flag embody the United States military strength and the ideals of liberty and freedom, respectively. The palm tree and cross symbolize the exotic foreignness of the land and the stubborn traditions of its people through their adherence to Catholicism. Although many U.S. citizens consider Christianity the ordained religion of progress and believe that it was the divine right to colonize the lands of native North American peoples, Catholicism, particularly in the context of Mexico, was associated with corruption and an unwillingness to modernize. Thus, as Harney and his troops forge ahead with strength and liberty, Mexico and its soldiers remain backwards, extolling a corrupt religion and trampled by a seemingly inevitable, the seemingly inevitable nature of progress. Through formal and iconographic analysis, we can identify the myriad ways U.S. cultural producers attempted to bolster national identity through the aggrandizement of its own forces and the denigration of the Mexican troops. Turning now to Mexico, uh, in the Mexican context, imagery of battle scenes produced for a Mexican audience are scant, but the few examples in existence similarly display visual cues that work to evoke sympathy for the Mexican troops and unite the Mexican people. This lithograph, produced in Europe for distribution in Mexico, depicts the Battle of Monterey, a multi-day battle in northern Mexico that involved assaults on the city's fortifications by multiple divisions of the U.S. Army. 
The battle ends ended with an eight-week armistice in exchange for Mexico's surrender of the city and the Mexican forces' armed evacuation. The fact that Mexico's 5,000-strong army was unable to defend the well-fortified city from General Zachary Taylor and his troops was a major blow to the Mexican army's morale, leading some scholars to argue that this battle marked the beginning of the end of the war for the Mexican forces. Many Mexican soldiers deserted as the army marched south. Yet this image conveys resolve instead of disillusion, unity instead of division. According to the caption beneath the image, the heroic defense of the city takes place on September 23rd, the final day of fighting. The scene maintains many markers of authenticity. Soldiers on both sides of the melee are dressed in accurate uniforms, and the conflict is set in the streets near the Plaza Mayor, in keeping with the battle reports that detailed the advancement of the US troops to two blocks east of the plaza. Yet the image also carries an agenda, as evidenced by this scene on the right. The colonel that we see here calls on the soldiers to forge ahead, and the troops enthusiastically follow. The soldiers represent a cross-section of the Mexican people. We have members of the officer corps clad in regulation um, uniforms, representing the upper echelons of society, while the dragoons, wearing a variety of attire, denote the poor farmers and laborers who are often coerced into service. Accompanying them is a military chaplain who we see here holding a cross you can barely make out in one hand and the Mexican flag in the other hand. The image works to convey a clear message. Regardless of their station in life, on the battlefield, each man exhibits heroism and resolve as they fight and die for their country. The depiction of the Mexican forces contrasts with the U.S. troops, who are barely visible, but important component of the image to reinforce Mexican identity. Several U.S. troops on the left attempt to make their way through the barricade, while three of their compatriots demonstrate that this journey is not an easy one, these three here. The U.S. soldiers following their commander, these three in particular, look young and almost timid and no match for the musket and axe wielding Mexican soldiers. In addition, the US reinforcements loudly shred, uh, loudly shroud, largely shroud in smoke appear small and insignificant. The image convinces the viewer that the Mexican forces are in control of this space through both the determination of its soldiers and the intimidating setting as the cathedral that we see in the background looms large overhead. Much like Courier's print, the image similarly conveys physical and ideological dominance over the enemy. Once again, we see this message through the use of flags and crosses. While Courier used the cross as a symbol of Mexico's weakness, here it is positioned as a source of strength and pride. As aforementioned, the Mexican chaplain thrusts the cross into the air with his right hand and bears the Mexican standard in his left hand. The chaplain's right hand leads the viewer's eye we follow the cross to these um, to the U.S. troops in the center background, which includes a barely visible U.S. flag right here. The Mexican standard points upward, um, mm -hmm, right, echoing the position of several of the muskets, also pointed upwards, uh, carried by the Mexican forces, and le leading the viewer's eye in the direction of the cathedral steeple in the central background. Each component, the flag, the cross, and the muskets, work together to communicate a clear message. Mexico's defense of Monterey was fought for the love of God and country against a weak and insignificant enemy. Although this print was made two years after the conclusion of the war, its outcome a major blow to Mexico, the need for a united national identity remained. When comparing this image to the lithograph that inspired, that inspired it, which you're seeing on the bottom right, we see that one of the most significant changes is the incorporation of this large cross-section of Mexican society. While the makeup of these troops is a relatively accurate depiction of the types of soldiers who participated in the defense of Monterey, the artists likely focused on these figures to establish societal unity. The war did little to unite deep divides between the classes that led to uprisings and frequent changes in government leadership. Thus, the artist recalls a time from the recent past when all Mexicans came together against a common enemy and when people put aside their differences to fight for country and honor. 
These ideals permeated the visual culture of the era on both sides of the border and extended to other media, such as satiric periodicals, to which we will now turn. While battle scene prints attempted to sway viewers' opinions of themselves and their enemies through pictorial nuance that incorporated cultural stereotyping and patriotic symbolism, satiric periodicals often exaggerated these same ideas to further their nationalistic agenda. The two publications we'll look at today both began uh, publication shortly after the outbreak of the war and addressed the conflict through satirical text and imagery guided by a central character that also provided each publication's title. These publications are Yankee Doodle on the left, a New York City-based weekly satirical journal first published in October of 1846, and El Calavera, a bi-weekly satiric periodical first printed in Mexico City in January of 1847. Both publications adopt, uh, attempted to incite a sense of national identity in their respective readers through depictions celebrating their homeland heroes and vilifying their neighboring enemies so that, regardless of the war's outcome, the people of each country would remain ideologically united behind principles of freedom, independence, and homeland. Both Yankee Doodle and El Calavera are early examples of satirical humor in the popular press in their respective nations and were likely inspired by European models such as the French Le Charivari and the British Punch, Punch magazine. To distinguish Yankee Doodle from its foreign precedents, editor Cornelius Matthews stated plainly within the pages of the periodical that the role of the publication's namesake was to, quote, embody and reproduce in permanent form that free spirit, that exuberant life, that creative energy, and refining enthusiasm which so eminently characterize us and distinguish the new world from the old. In the Mexican context, while depictions of El Calavera or the skull date back to pre-conquest Aztec imagery, editor Ignacio Diaz Trioique's illustrated satirical publication would have been a novelty to viewers, as it is generally credited as one of the first of its kind in Mexico. Regardless of the inspiration for these publications, the editors of both journals consistently published images that incorporated negative stereotypes of the enemy while celebrating their homeland. Unlike the battle scene prints discussed earlier, which focused on the events of the war on the battlefield, satiric periodicals primarily centered on the important political figures and diplomatic events that steered the course of the war, satirizing the enemy to gain popular support for the war cause. In the July 17, 1847 edition of Yankee Doodle, Santa Anna and his generals incorporates exaggerated stereotypes to, to humiliate the country's leadership as the caricature's namesakes are depicted from left to right as neurotic, inept, sulky, and devious. Each figure dons an elaborate hat and bears a grotesque expression accentuated by absurd eyebrows and the stereotypical large mustache, an omnipresent feature of Mexican soldiers in images created by U.S. artists. Mexican President General Antonio Lopez de Santa Anna, the second from the right, looks despondent and frail as he clutches his cloak tighter to his torso and looks up hopelessly at his oversized headgear. His sizing is actually out of character, as the general was infamously tall. The incongruity is explained in the text beneath the image, as the editor explains that this group portrait was inspired by the publication of the first volume of J.T. Headley's book, Napoleon and His Marshals. These, figu excuse me, these figures, the editor states with heavy sarcasm, are, quote, a group of four heroes whose prowess, if not cut off in the bud by some mishap to which military chieftains are particularly liable, will no doubt rival those of the little corporal. The image and text work together to demean Mexican leaders and, in a subtler manner, celebrate U.S. victory. As the text goes on to read, quote, The Palms, Rio Grande, Buena Vista, Monterey, Cerro Gordo will remain monuments of what the generals would have accomplished had it not been for a series of unlooked-for accidents, which Generals Taylor and Scott of the U.S. Army were mainly instrumental in producing." End quote. The publication plays on Santa Anna's nickname of the Napoleon of the West to a humiliating effect, seemingly inferring that Santa Anna, like Napoleon, will end up disgraced and exiled due to the ineptitude of himself and his generals, and the peerless prowess of the U.S. military leaders.
While Santa Ana and his generals used exaggerated stereotypes to demean the Mexican military, the periodical also featured images meant to highlight the diplomatic superiority of U.S. leaders at the expense of their Mexican counterparts. Triumph of the Lithion from the April 10, 1847 edition of the periodical seen here is one such example. The cartoon illustrates the peace negotiations between the two warring countries through the three political figures featured in the foreground. In the background, Yankee Doodle observes the scene at a distance, but with his hand to his chin in thought. In the foreground, President Polk is the central and imposing figure who calmly administers Lethion to Santa Ana by holding uh, the tube from, that extends from the anesthetics container and with the other hand, forcing Santa Ana to swallow the stub substance by plugging the general's nose. The jug on the left of the image, in addition to the Lethion label, uh, is also marked $3 million that you see here, the amount appropriated by Congress in 1847 to negotiate peace with Mexico. Santa Ana, with his characteristic long hair and large mustache, resigns himself to accept the sus substance as his hands are literally and figuratively tied and he closes his eyes and leans forward to receive the anesthetic. Meanwhile, Thomas Hart Benton, a senator from Missouri and a staunch advocate of the westward expansion of the United States, saws off Santa Ana's left leg, labeled New Mexico, while Santa Ana's infamous prosthetic peg leg is visible behind Benton. And you can just make it out here, the peg. The cartoon humiliates Santa Ana on multiple levels. His willing acceptance of the $3 million would have contradicted the popular opinion of Mexican society and government as the United States began a new offensive targeting Veracruz and Mexico City by the time negotiation talks formally began, making any consideration of peace a disgrace. In addition, Benton saws off Santa Ana's left leg, which further highlights the inconsistency. It was this same leg that already had already been amputated in 1938 during the pastry war with France. Although the United States was not involved in that conflict, the switch brings attention to the fate of the prosthetic leg, which was captured by US forces during the Battle of Cerro Gordo, and oddly enough is still on display at the Illinois State Military Museum. Benton, and by extension the US forces, immobilized Santa Ana militaristically through the capture of his prosthetic leg and politically by forcing him to accept an unpopular peace agreement. While in reality a treaty was not signed until the following year, the implications of the image that the United States is clearly in control of its foe is made clear. The stereotypes of the enemy included in the representation of Santa Ana reached across multiple media platforms as seen in this single sheet lithograph that similarly used the theme of bodily dismemberment as an allegory for military paralysis. Each figure features, um, features are exaggerated to the point of absurdity with long unkept hair, bushy facial hair, and noses so large that they peek out from under the soldier's large sombreros. Their military uniforms distinguish their officer rank, but they are completely defenseless in the wake of their limb amputation. They stare in bewilderment at their missing legs, resigned to this loss of body, as perhaps an allusion to the presumed loss of land that Mexico would endure in the coming months. As many US citizens viewed the war and the eventual, eventual extension of the US's lands to the Pacific coast as divinely ordained, mm -hmm. cultural consumers viewed these images of Mexicans' compliance with the loss of land as appropriately emblematic of the forthcoming U.S. victory. Switching to Mexico, in this context, satiric publications similarly bolstered views of viewers' sense of national identity at the expense of their foe, while at the same time extolling the virtues of the homeland through allegorical figures that incorporated popular Mexican traditions. Although the character of Yankee Doodle rarely featured prominently in the pages of his namesake publication, the images featured in the satiric periodical El Calavera always featured the character of the same name, and you see him here on the right-hand side of this masthead. The inaugural issue of El Calavera specifically identifies its namesake character as the hero of the publication stating, quote, you will see that a calavera, if he is understood, with only a picaresque epigram can change the lover of meanness to good, end quote. Although El Calavera was first positioned as an objective bystander, 
can see he's sort of outside of the melee in this one. He became increasingly prominent in later images as the war progressed and Mexican citizens became increasingly disenfranchised as their military forces suffered continuous defeat and the U.S. troops moved ever closer to the capital. In a cartoon published in the May 7, 1847 edition of El Calavera, the main character takes center stage, embodying the nation's ideals and conveying no signs of an impending defeat. Rather than dwell on the disillusion and despair of losing almost half of the nation's territory, El Calavera maintains a courageous outlook and firmly extols the virtues of his nation. The character wears a regulation uniform of the Mexican army and proudly holds in one hand a flag that bears the freedom the values of freedom, homeland, uh, independence, and homeland, while on the other hand raises a sword ready for battle. The sword is positioned directly in front of the flag with El Calavera's hand in front of the word independencia or independence and the sword pointing to the word patria or homeland. Much like the chaplain's positioning in the heroic defense of the city of Monterey, the image makes clear the ideals the troops aim to defend during the conflict. While El Calavera's attire and accessories link to current events, the skull mask he wears carries a long history in Mexican imagery. And I have a few examples seen here. Skulls were an integral part of pre-conquest Aztec imagery and maintained a significant role in Mex Mexican visual culture during the colonial era. In addition, skeletons featured prominently in images commem commemorating the Day of the Dead, a holiday that transcended class boundaries. Thus, the character of El Calavera is a figure who embodies the nation's ideals and infirm, affirms the continuity of long-standing traditions despite these turbulent times. As El Calavera courageously strides into battle, he effortlessly, effortlessly tramples his enemy, symbolized by the objects under his feet. Beneath his right foot lies a disabled cannon with several cannonballs haphazard, haphazardly cast on the ground. Under the cannon is the U.S. flag, not particularly visible, um, and its staff leads the viewer's eye to this creature on the right. The monstrous figure bears the face and military coat of a soldier, but his body is grotesque, with the paws of a beast and the torso and legs, if you will, of a snake. The last loop of the figure's body is conspic conspicuously labeled invasion, invasion, uh, and the creature raises its tail, as if about to strike. Any potential threat is suppressed by El Calavera, who drives the Mexican flag staff straight into the creature's head. The symbolism throughout the vignette is clear. Neatly stacked cannonballs, like the ones you see here, and their powerful associated weapon, were consistently included in wartime imagery to represent the military prowess of the U.S. forces, as featured on this song sheet cover. Here, on the left, the military might is scattered across the page, and the flag is pinned down by the celebrated weapon, the defenses and patriotic symbols of the U.S. dismantled under the tread of El Calavera. The creature's dual deceitful identity, a respectable soldier upon first glance, but in reality, a monstrous snake, links to the perception in Mexico of the United States as a suspicious aggressor, stemming from the U.S.'s perceived involvement in Texas's secession from Mexico and further bolstered, of course, once the war began. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although the image villainizes the United States through this depiction, the main focus is essentially on the triumph of El Calavera. The treachery and self-aggrandizement of the United States are set against the earnest values of Mexico. The young face of the deceitful creature contrasted by the skull that links to centuries-old traditions. El Calavera states in the prologue that accompanies this image, quote, For I have been invited to come back from the afterlife, so that I give back to my beloved office, end quote as if to assert that even when inevitable defeat makes the principles of national identity difficult to maintain, the traditions and ideals of the nation will always return. In conclusion, the us versus them model in which nations define themselves in opposition to their enemies was integral to the establishment of national identity during the US-Mexican War. Before the conflict, both countries used visual imagery to distinguish themselves from their foreign rulers after gaining independence, transforming the allegory of America 
from a generic symbol of the Western Hemisphere to a localized figure that reflected constructions of the national past and elucidated the present. With the outbreak of the war, allegorical figures alone remained insufficient to create distinctions between two nations that were once allies and buoy support for a war that was unpopular in both countries. Cultural producers in both nations turned to stylized images on the battlefield and satirical depictions of diplomacy to glorify their own forces and belittle their enemy. Through comparative analysis, we see that artists on both sides of the border use similar strategies to separate themselves from their foe in an effort to bolster national identity when ideals of whom and what constituted a nation were rapidly shifting. Thank you. Questions? Yes? Short answer is depends. Um, some of the really big firms could have full-time lithographers, but lithography is exploding at this time to the point that um, there are artists who are making satirical imagery for this publisher, and making battle scenes for this publisher, and sort of yeah, freelancing a lot more, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, that's in the US context. In Mexico, um, especially for satiric periodicals like El Calavera, um, there was a fair amount of um, government regulation in the press, so the artists necessarily remained uh, anonymous. It's sort of exciting that we even know the publisher's name for El Calavera. Um, and actually, uh, El Calavera in particular was um, stopped by the government and Trio AK was uh, jailed. So. Um, so those artists we know a lot less about just because they had to sort of remain under the, the radar of the government. Thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. um, was, the, was the subject part of the mythology, were they really doing images for the elite in the country? Because you mentioned New York and New York City, mm -hmm. were they Great question. Again, the short answer is depends. Um, so the colored lithographs would have been for an elite audience because those were harder to make and they had to be hand colored at this time. So that's much more for the upper echelons. Um, but a lot of the, the black and white lithographs, um, those were definitely for a broader audience than before. That's not to say that everyone on the street had access to them, um, but they were certainly a lot more inexpensive. This is sometimes called the penny press too, just because um, these publications were often only a cent or two. Um, so they were definitely had a much broader audience. Because um, we have to remember at this time, still in the 1840s, um, art is still very much for the elite. So this is sort of bringing a brand new audience to um, these sorts of images that were much more in line with fine art, certainly not the sort of thing you would see uh, displayed at a gallery or anything like that, but certainly uh, with a much broader audience in mind than, say, a, a painting. Mm -hmm. Hmm, that's a good question. Interestingly, uh, this, um, a lot of Texas museums have huge collections of stuff related to the U.S. Mexican War, not surprisingly. Um, but Louisiana is really the, the main place for news. That's where all the news is coming in and then sent out throughout the, the nation, the U.S. Um, but in terms of Texas, um, I think that there's less distribution of these images um, simply because some of the fighting is going on in what we now know as Texas um, and uh, it had just been uh, entered into the Union the year before the war breaks out um, so it does not have the same uh, sort of distribution centers that we have in other major cities um, so I think the the distribution is a lot more limited <laughs> 
Hmm. Broadsheets, definitely. Sort of like the call to arms one I showed. Um, but in terms of these sort of uh, colored lithographs or things of that sort, no, not really. And besides, I don't know that they really needed to do a lot of encouraging to get people to enlist in Texas, um, just because people were, were very excited to join the U.S. Army to fight against its uh, previous um, country. Any other questions? Yes. Well, I think the main, the most important thing was that the images made clear who won. So it was, if there were a bunch of um, heads with blood spewing from them, that made all the more clear that it was, if we think about the courier image, um, that Mexico is definitely on the losing side of this. In terms of the really blatant violence, I don't think it was particularly um, curtailed by publishers and certainly not by the government because these sorts of images, we also have things like uh, disaster images that were sort of generic like a, a town on fire. And then that would be used if there was a fire in Philadelphia or a fire in Boston. And these sorts of images could be reused. So um, those were sort of useful in that um, the violent depiction had a common look about it so that it could be used in different contexts. So the short answer is not a, not a lot of oversight with violence. Because there are ones that um, the, uh, the death of Major Ringold, um, he was stabbed in both of his thighs uh, and I think also received a gunshot wound and there's all sorts of blood and all sorts of gore uh, in the many depictions of that image. So violence, very, very pertinent. And it becomes all the more real to us when it's in color too. Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.